Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending and being present on this webinar or panel discussion, as I would like to call it better, uh, an online event organized by Marie Curie Alumni Association. It is well known that women are underrepresented in careers in science. In academia, considerable attention has been focused on the paucity of women at the lecturer level and the even more lamentable state of affairs at more senior levels. The academic career path has a long apprenticeship and typically there is an undergraduate degree followed by a PhD, then some postdoctoral research contracts and research fellowships and then finally a more stable lectureship or permanent leader position with promotion um, on up the ladder to follow. It is the 8th of March, so the International Women's Day, and particularly on this day, we would like to talk about and hear some experiences on combining a scientific career with the duties of motherhood. With me today are some uh, amazing mother scientists. I will start by Professor Mirela Delibegovic, a Dean for Research at the University of Aberdeen and Director of Aberdeen Cardiovascular and Diabetes Center, and a mother of two children. Hi, Mirella, and welcome, and thanks for accepting my invitation. Hi, Blaise, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm Professor Catherine de Boc, uh, professor at ETH City and a mother of four children. Hi, Catherine, and thanks for being present here. Hi, Bessa, good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Dr. Olga Tura, uh, she is a junior group leader and assistant professor at University of Girona and a mother of three. Hi, Olga, and thank you for being here. Hi, thanks to you to invite us, to invite me. And uh, we're also having a recent mother, uh, Dr. Paola Perota, which as of May 2022 will be a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University at Simmons Lab. I Hi, Paola, that. ciao, and Hi. thank you for being here. Ciao, Beza, thanks for the invitation. I'm so uh, for the for the people who are listening, I think they might have the option to pin the videos of the panelists so they can have the videos of you uh, while you're talking. Uh, they have already had uh, your short videos and are aware uh, what you actually do as a scientist and that you are mothers, but it would be very welcome if you can shortly each of you starting from Mirela, maybe uh, tell us tell us about uh, who you are or how people know you. Would you mind if you start first, Mirela? Yeah, of course. So um, I've been working in the field of diabetes and heart disease for over 20 years now. Um, so I guess my path is very much of what you just talked about. I did an undergraduate degree and then, um, you know, I had a love and passion for diabetes research basically throughout my undergraduate degree and I never had an opportunity to do any hands-on diabetes research so when it came to my final year uh, at uni at Edinburgh University there was an opportunity to do a project but it meant kind of going away for a few months to Smith and Beecham Pharmaceuticals at the time and I have to say there was a kind of a career changing opportunity for me so now when I talk about how one should think about their career nothing is ever planned it looks like you planned it but it's never planned but it's kind of, I always found that in life, taking a slightly harder path has been the most beneficial one. So going away um, down to um, Essex, you know, in the, kind of the middle of nowhere and spending three months there has really opened up all the opportunities that later came in life. Because that left to go to a PhD um, in Dundee that left. To, led to a postdoctoral fellowship in Boston that led to the permanent academic position in Aberdeen. So um, I don't say that one has to move around to be successful. That's not the case and it shouldn't be the case, but it definitely opens up so many opportunities. Every time you move somewhere, you meet new interesting people, you make new friends and therefore new networks. So um, I really enjoyed that path, and I, I guess people know me as a as a person working on on diabetes for so many years. Um, but I don't. I guess we'll come to it later. But I, what I would like to to say is that one should also think that children are a part part of your life and part of your scientific growth. I think if I haven't hadn't had the children when I did, I wouldn't have been as good a scientist or an academic. Um, because it made me focus and really think about bigger picture. So um, can I stop there and let other people speak? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We will have plenty of questions and Thanks, things to talk Lisa. about. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we move on to Catherine. Yes. So uh, I actually think I'm uh, mostly known for my work on endothelial metabolism, but um, 
What less people know is that I am actually trained as an exercise physiologist. I did my PG in exercise physiology. And then also by coincidence, so for sure it was not a planned move, I ended up um, studying metabolism in, um, in, in endothelial cells uh, during developmental angiogenesis and, uh, and, and tumor angiogenesis. And it was during my, P my postdoc actually that uh, we published um, uh, quite a, a landmark paper on how endothelial cells metabolically rewired during uh, angiogenesis. I was just uh, explaining before this, this uh, talk went, went online already to, to the others that, that more or less at the end of my postdoc, I or my pregnancy uh, somewhat set the deadline on, on um, the resubmission of the paper. And actually it was quite a fortunate event because it turned out that if we would have submitted two months later, we would have been scooped by by another group. So I did. So I did my postdoc in uh, endothelial metabolism, and then uh, got an assistant professorship also locally uh, in in Belgium. Uh, but I soon realized that being very close to my previous mentor and, and somewhat entering a different field was not the, the best way to uh, attract grant funding. And uh, yeah, also there by coincidence, there was this opening or an available position at, at ETH in Zurich. And then I decided uh, to move to ETH where I'm now uh, leading a lab studying how uh, muscle adapts to training and um, and and to to and yeah so what is regenerating in response to pathological uh, settings obviously with a focus on meta metabolic crosstalk and and with a high interest on on angiogenesis I'm working in Zurich my family is still living in Belgium so during the week I'm the scientist in the weekends I'm mama taxi <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> okay, now that you the fuel prices have gone up, maybe you're planning to switch to only cycling as a taxi mama or <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, then we move on with Olga, please. Hi. Um my so I'm from Girona, is a little city, a hundred thousand citizens north of Spain. Um, when I finished my degree in biology, I moved to Edinburgh as well to do a PhD. And it was, again, it's true, a bit of a, a lucky event because uh, I had the possibility to work uh, with the blood transfusion service in Scotland and then after with Professor Sir Ian Wilmot, uh, who reprogrammed Dolly the Ship. So it, it was, I think, uh, good luck I, I was there. And I learned all about hematopoietic and progenitor cells as well, in the theory of progenitor cells. And then I did the PhD there. Um, at the end of my PhD, I, I was pregnant with my first child. So it was a bit of a crazy moment defending my PhD thesis with a, a belly of eight months uh, pregnant, but we managed it. Uh, luckily, I felt, felt quite good. Um, and then afterwards, I stayed there. So in total, I stayed in the UK for 11 years. And, and then I really wanted to go back to my family and my country. So uh, I applied for a, an individual fellowship, Marie Curie um, integrated, integrating grant. So I managed to go back to Barcelona. It's not exactly my city, but it's only an hour by train. So um, for, since 2013, I was there as a postdoc. Uh, and that was a department of respiratory diseases. So I tried to apply what I knew about uh, progenitor cells and endothelial progenitor cells, but in other, uh, because in Edinburgh I was more in the cardiovascular system. Um, so more or less I applied it to a respiratory system. Um, then in recently in 2018, I moved to uh, Girona, my, my town city, and is where I'm hoping next year I'll be established as a, as, a, as a principal investigator. At the moment, I'm a junior investigator group leader. So I hope next year, if we repeat 
this webinar, I can tell you that it's been a long journey, but I hope it's going to be okay. And at, at the end, I have three children. So Okay, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. That's amazing. But uh, you've had your defense while being pregnant with your first child, Roger, right? Which yes. means that uh, also your first child, Roger, has a PhD, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, and a British passport. <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Olga. Maybe now we'll pass on with Paola. Even though Paola just recently became mother, but uh, maybe she can share the, the, the change that has happened with her view. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, I'm very happy to participate in this webinar. Uh, actually, uh, to be honest, when Bess asked me to share my experience as a mother in science, I was a bit surprised because uh, I became mother indeed of uh, this beautiful baby girl just last August. So, so and I will start my postdoc at Yale University. So um in may so if i think to uh or i refer to the title of this uh, webinar i can probably say that i'm at the, the beginning of this uh, bridge so i'm also eager to hear and learn from the experience of these uh, brilliant professors who are today that we have today and uh, we've managed to realize their dreams of becoming mom and uh, uh, being also successful in their uh, professional careers um, so as uh, Besa mentioned, I graduated uh, with a, a master in uh, pharmaceutical science uh, in uh, uh, Italy. Uh, I come from Italy, so I graduated in Italy in uh, Tuscany, in Siena, and then uh, um, after my graduation, I um, uh, um, follow a, a, an advanced master in oncological pharmacology. In, at the University of Milan. Um, and after that, I um, received uh, a fellowship for young scientists uh, promoted by the um, Italian Society of Pharmacology. And uh, I spent uh, two years uh, at, uh, for uh, studying and uh, for doing some research at Yale uh, University in the laboratory of pharmacology uh, directed by Professor Sessa. Uh, in uh, was December 2015 when I was selected uh, uh, in uh, the Moglinet uh, project, which is a, a Marie Curie joint doctoral program. And uh, during my uh, between the University of Antwerp and the University of Leiden, uh, during my uh, um, doctoral uh, period, I uh, work mainly on uh, uh, metabolism. In particular, I study the effect of uh, glycolysis inhibition uh, on, in endothelial cells in the context of uh, atherosclerosis. And then what happened? In uh, August 2020, I married with uh, uh, my long-term uh, uh, partner uh, who I met uh, during uh, uh, my college period. And uh, in uh, August 2021, I um, uh, was, uh, I, <laughs> um, Rita uh, came in my life. Uh, so uh, I was well, as I said before, I will start my postdoc in May in the uh, US. Um, and today I think that um, um, I can share, yes, my short experience of being a mother and a scientist, but uh, maybe um, I can share my expectation, uh, uh, which are probably the same of uh, uh, other uh, girls like me who are in the world of science, but also dream to become mothers. Uh, I don't know if I can continue. For example, I, for me, is, uh, it all started in December 2020 when I discovered that I was pregnant. Uh, and uh, although of, um, all of this uh, happened in the midst of my uh, PhD thesis preparation, the day I found out that I was expecting a baby, it was, uh, and I can say today, is one of the most beautiful and exciting day of my life. Uh, I remember I was watching my belly grow while working on my thesis and uh, writing my latest paper. Uh, in March, I successfully defend my thesis, uh, and uh, I remember submitting also the my last article uh, just a week before uh, my little baby girl was born. So all of these 
time I was feeling that the ability of achieving uh, my goals together with my baby girl was making me uh, everything of even greater value and uh, uh, meaning. And yeah. so, yeah, it's... Uh, Def definitely. It just changed the way you see the world yes, afterwards. Definitely, thank yes. you. Thank you. I will pass by on uh, some some more questions and I'll try to combine them so we can have more uh, more questions tackling and uh, still winning on time. Women, especially those who, who are family oriented, always puzzle with the question of the right timing for the family. And if I have a look, for example, at your bio, I can say that, okay, Merida is now Dean of Research, Director, Katrin has a professorship um, position, so they are stable enough and therefore they can have children now. But if you if you look back, the, the first child of Merida is turning 15 now, right? And yeah. one of the children of Katrin is 18, so a long time before they already have had children. This is the part where girl, girls struggle and I've seen this, I've, I've noticed among girls, especially those who want to pursue the academia, the fear is bigger. What is your perception and what's your message to young women, especially those in science, in, in terms of um, the right time for family? So would you like me to start, Besa? Yeah, as, as you wish. As yeah, you wish. okay. So I I should say that, you know, if one thinks about it, there's never a the right time because there's always a reason not to have children, right? There's always, oh, I need to be in the most secure contract. And we will come to this because I can see the questions being asked. So, I mean, I can, I can tell you my story. Um, you know, I when I suggested to my husband, we've been married for, uh, I met him during a PhD and we've been married a few years. And I said, well, you know, when should we have children? When should we have children? He kind of kept saying, well, I think we should wait until we have permanent positions. And at one point I said, you know, that's probably never going to happen. <laughs> Seriously, in science, because my husband is an academic as well. Um, so actually for me, the deciding point came, um, I was in my first postdoc and you know, my I was on a fellowship and my fellowship was going to finish. And my boss suddenly came to the lab meeting to announce that he was moving the lab. So he was moving from Boston, so from Harvard to Toronto. And whoever wanted to come with him could come. And I guess if you don't, you have a year to find a job. And I just thought, you know what? I am just going to have a child. I'm going to try and have a child now because... It, you know, as in like, if I want to pursue a um, career in academia, it's probably the best time to be in between contracts because then it won't look like such a grey, grey area in my CV. I'll have an excuse for having a grey area sort of thing. So, I mean, we were lucky enough that several months later I did get pregnant, but I always think the children bring their own luck, you know. So I assumed I was going to be without a job. And I assumed that we would somehow survive on his one postdoctoral salary and we will find a way. But then an opportunity came up back in Scotland where they were looking for a faculty member and both my husband and I applied. So actually, when I interviewed, this is 15, 16 years ago, when I interviewed, it was, it was a um, Skype interview. It was the first time, you, you know, you're, you're actually, it's kind of COVID days. So I interviewed and they offered me a job after the interview the following morning. So I said, well, I would like to come and visit Aberdeen. I'd never been to Aberdeen, even though I lived in Scotland for such a long time. So when I came and I asked if I could see the nursery facilities, they kept saying to me, oh, and um, how old is your child? And I said, actually, it's in my womb. I'm six months pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I mean you know there is never a right time so this is what I mean you you just have to decide when is the time right for you because if you wait too long unfortunately you may never be able to have children and you know as I say I believe that being pregnant with Said my son who's 15 brought me those amazing opportunities which maybe wouldn't have happened because it wouldn't have been the same kind of mother tigress drive that i had so there we go that's my story yeah 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 and what about you Catherine? Uh, what was I, the right timing for you the perception i agree of that? i agree with mirella that there is never a good time i also disagree because i i also always tend to say that there is never a bad time to to become a mother and um as a scientist, and definitely if you want to pursue an ac academic career, you will always be busy, right? 
so so I always tell my people to not uh, depend their family or to not plan their family planning or to not make their family plan to be dependent on their their career planning and I mean, from my personal experience, though, I would say that the 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 postdoc that was the most intense period of all when it comes to um, str- um, workload, when it comes to when it comes to timing. So that I would, from my own experience, say was the most difficult period. As a professor, it's a bit diff- different because you can work from home a bit more. You can plan yourself a bit uh, a bit more. Um, whereas this is not always possible, at least not in all labs, uh, to do this as a postdoc. But I would generally advise, look, guys, not girls, plan your family independent of your career. I, I would, yeah. I wouldn't see why one should not do this. Yeah, but then it's rather difficult because you always have to rely on all the, let's say, incoming and everything that is in supporting a family. Yes, I mean, I agree there. I do think, though, that, for instance, obviously, I don't know how it is in in other countries, but where when I did my 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 PhD and also my my postdoc in in Belgium, the childcare daycare is very very well organized. So the somewhat all the the conditions which you need to efficiently condi- continue to work and to to do research were in place. And this I often see that these conditions or all the surrounding conditions do you do you have family close by do you live in a country where there is good daycare um is your partner supportive uh, are both of you uh, having the ability to take care of the kids that those are really the important decisions and the important yeah factors that one should not should take into consideration rather than the 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 yeah the stage of your career in which you are in because i completely agree it is uh, it is it is not easy to end up and it's in a, in a stable position and in a, in a permanent position uh within a scientific track so i mean i wouldn't yeah have my family decisions be dependent on this i have to say at least I didn't do so. Yes, I also um, improvise, if you want to say, a little bit, because I agree that it's never the right time. Um, I'm not I'm not in a stable position yet. So I've been, and I am struggling to, to, to have funding for myself and, and for my kids, I have to say that it's true that in my case, my partner had uh, more or less a stable condition, or a bit more stable than me. And of course, this helps a lot. Uh, was it the was it the chil- children the reason why you had to move uh, back to Spain, Olga? Well, uh, yeah, when I had two kids, very little ones, <laughs> and I was doing my postdoc uh, in Edinburgh. I was a crazy mother. I mean, uh, 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 <laughs> I was running with my car up and down, taking the kids' nursery, coming back. And then you see the other mothers walking really nicely, talking, chatting with the other mothers. And I felt bad. Uh, it's true. I never felt in a right. So I always feel that I wasn't a great mother and I wasn't a great scientist. I always was in the middle. Or maybe I should have thought more positively. Maybe I was good at both sides, but um, I always have to balance all the time. No, what what do I do today? Maybe Mondays and Thursdays I take the day a bit off, or I finish work a bit earlier to spend more time with the kids, and maybe I work at night. Well, really, you you have to have a lot of passion to 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 keep going and 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 have to love science maybe a stubborn character i don't know uh, something that that and maybe very convinced that you want to have children i will do the same if i have to go back i will repeat the same steps i will i'm not regretting having children at all 
Okay, that's cool, impressive. But I, actually, I think it's a tendency of women to have this uh, under appreciation for themselves. They do all the work and all the, the motherhood tasks and everything, and still they think that they are somewhere in between, mm. which actually I think is not true. So may I comment on this? Yes, please. I, I, I think I recognize myself very well in, in the, 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 the story that Olga is, uh, has been telling. So I have lived my life as a scientist with two, two devils on my shoulder. One telling me I have to be in the lab and have to work. And the other one telling me I have to be at home with my kids, right? And it has been really, really difficult also for me to, to split up life, to have this work-life balance. In fact, maybe we might come to this, uh, this later. But for many, many years, my life was either being with my family or being in the lab. I don't have a television at home still. I don't have one. And there is a reason for this because I sacrificed a lot for my career and to be able to combine my career with, with my family. This said, at the time I was doing my postdoc, my mentor at that time, Peter Karmelit, he told me that he has had the same problem throughout his career. However, and, and that he was away for a lot of times, being very little available for his kids. However, he also told me that his kids then later told him that they always appreciated the passion he had and the persistency he developed to achieve what he wanted to achieve and that they were really proud of their dad. And I, this is something I've always been remembering. And I have to, and I mean, and, and now if I look at my own kids, Ah, Catherine, you're muted. Now it's okay. I was muted by the host, so they want no, me to no. go. So all of my kids, they also meanwhile developed an, an interest for science. And, and one of my daughters, she actually wants to become a scientist because she really likes it. We have a small microscope at home. So I, I feel... I And maybe this is somewhat to comfort my own... Uh, uh, um, my own uh, mindset so to speak and I, I I still feel I was able to inspire them to some extent so That's this great. somewhat eases my mind at the, this moment yeah but since we are here Catherine uh you, you you've mentioned and actually you're somehow living a dual life like work and sleep in Zurich and then doing the mama taxi in Belgium how how hard is this and how how do your children accept the fact of not having uh, their mom during the during the whole week almost huh? at yes. home how it is it's it's three nights huh? so usually I'm away from a Monday morning until Thursday evening and I have to be honest and say that for me it is much more it's much easier to do it like this because I am really focused on on science from Monday to Thursday evening and then in the weekends I'm more yeah, I'm there for my family, but I'm there 100% for my family. And in the past, when I was still, when I was still living and working uh, in Belgium, this was much more difficult uh, to compare. So, I highly respect those women who are able to combine all of this at the same time and to to do this. Yeah, bringing the kids to the sports and the uh, and school and. Uh, and while at the same time um, being being a sci I mean doing their their daily uh, uh, scientific uh, duties, duties, this yeah. always was for me very very difficult. And I can still vividly recall me ironing while meanwhile uh, answering emails, and this was so stressful. And at some point, I really decided this has to stop. There has to be. A, a split between work and life and uh, for me this was a physical split but I think for for most other uh, people I think those who manage to really um, yeah integrate or, or make it make a clear split between between life and work those those are the ones that 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 are the most successful I would say so now you finally split emailing and ironing <laughs> yes and I pay <laughs> And I pay a cleaning lady as well. So <laughs> that's the advantage of a permit. That's maybe even better. Okay, but now maybe also the opinion from Paula. The... Yeah, if I can, uh, it's amazing and it's really inspiring um, listen to, 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 to you because it's um, uh, like at the end of the day, I think that from the experience that um, we are uh, hearing today is uh, 
um, being a mother improves anyway and enrich uh, not only your uh, private life but also your professional life because uh, um, from what I understood today is like it teaching you even more the importance of being a, a team at work but also in your personal life uh, like with your baby your partner your family so it's like uh, and uh, this is uh, really really important I think and uh, of course it's not be easy it, it is not easy because uh, uh, yeah I agree the scientist work does not have fix hours and uh, is a job that keeps you constantly busy uh, often it's uh, you to have a backpack on your uh, shoulder to move in different places like me now um, but uh, yeah I hope that um, uh, more and more women uh, still uh, do not give up uh, uh, their dream of uh, pursuing a career yeah. in scientific research uh, while becoming also a mom so uh, so now I, it's your turn to backpack Rita yes, and move so on now it's my to turn. US. I, yeah. I prepare my backpack uh, also Rita's backpack <laughs> So it's with me. Uh, um, yeah, it's. Um, I think that in this period, uh, I have different feelings. Uh, from one point, I feel really exciting and uh, uh, scared at the same time because I know uh, that uh, it will not be easy for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't want to give up uh, my my dreams. So it's like, uh, and at the same time, I want that uh, my my children or my, my kids now my uh, see me happy uh, otherwise if i renew, if, if i don't 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 do what i really decide what wish to do it's like i think that it's uh, uh, i i leave something right it's not uh, it's not a, the, the 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 good choice of, for me but also for her because uh, i would not be happy uh, and uh, I don't want to regret this. Uh, yeah. You won't so. be happy if you wouldn't pursue your dream. And then yeah, as, a, it, uh, as a result, also, that would be interpreted to Rita as well, to your daughter. OK, yeah. I see also uh, some questions here. And uh, one of them is matching with, uh, with one that I have. Uh, here we have a good mix because um, the partners uh, are two and two, like two are in academia and two are not in academia. I know that the partner of Mireya and of Paula are in academia, are in science related, and of Olga and Katrin are non-science related. And we would like to know what are the advantages or disadvantages of having or not having the partner in academia. What is it? How helpful? How, how it... Uh, how it comes up with the family part? If I if, if I can start, what I, I just said, the the having a partner who has a more permanent position helps you to a bit be more unstable, no? That to have a bit more maybe the chances to apply or or to try to pursue your dream. But in the other hand, I think that if it's uh, if he's got more a permanent position and works in a business or something that that cannot move because as we as most of our scientists we have to move around so um, i mean maybe not very often but at some point we have to go to do our stages or postdocs or something then maybe it's a bit more difficult that your partner can follow you um and the kids as well <laughs> it's not uh, easy and then maybe you have to go yourself alone that you're a bit further from the family i will say that this is maybe an advantage and a disadvantage but have you considered i was also thinking have you uh, sometimes considered changing uh, let's say postdoc or other tenure track positions based on the uh paternity maternity leave policies of a country let's say different countries have different policies have you have you thought of yeah that? i mean i moved to spain that is one of the worst <laughs> of uh, uh work life um, balance but uh, that wasn't my option it was where i came from so i had um, if i had to choose where to go definitely i will go to another a country that has a bit more flexibility in, in balance. We are improving but slowly. Yeah. But you wouldn't have then the grandparents with which would be no. a good help. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, the time I didn't have the grandparents, I had to have a babysitter uh, to help me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who next would like to have a thought have a word on this? Well I can maybe talk about somebody whose partner is in a 
in academic. As I say, I met my husband when we were both just starting our PhDs. So we started at the same time. And then obviously through the postdocs. And um, I thought personally that it is easier to have a partner who is an academic and really understands that lifestyle. Um, you know, how many times has he worked in the lab one, two o'clock in the morning, you know, cycled through the snowstorm in Boston to just go and change media or inject some mice, you know, because it's part of the experiment. I think I think personally it helps for the other person to understand the pressures you've got and what you've got to do, and it's kind of taken for granted. But it has been really tricky because my husband and I are in the same field. Uh, so when we did our PhDs, he was working on cancer, I was working on diabetes, so it's different conferences, etc. But then for postdocs, we both started, you know, he started working on diabetes, which makes it more tricky because. How do you decide whose career takes priority, right? And we always decided that we were going to support each other. And whatever opportunities come up, we will just do our best that we work as a team. So actually, we have always worked as a team. And I think it's helped us because when we did our PhDs, the way we met, he worked for, um, you know, a guy and I worked for the wife. And, um, you know, it was a big unit. It was an MRC unit in UK. And we could see that that works really well as a team as a team. So you've got a family unit and the lab is a family unit sort of thing as well. You run everything as a family. So all the PhD students, when you think about it, are your children, right? You 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 take care of them and you care for them as if they were your own children. So um, first thing I remember when I had said, and you know, I was breastfeeding. So first thing he said to me, my husband, as soon as you stop breastfeeding, book yourself onto a major conference and just go away. And I did. I went to a Keystone conference for a week in Canada, right? And he called his parents to come and help out. And, and actually, I needed, he was right, I needed to kind of show to the people that I'm available. Because one of the questions was about motherhood and whether you're taken seriously. I've missed out on a lot of opportunities because people assume that, oh, I would be too busy or I must be on maternity leave as if such a thing exists when you're a scientist and an academic. You know, so I, I wasn't involved in a lot of grants because of that. So I think he kind of pushed me towards going to conferences but then there were conflicts and I think I put that in my biography where both of us were invited to speak at the same conference you know major conference in Amsterdam I remember and at this point I called my mother to fly from Bosnia she came from Bosnia to Aberdeen to babysit so that both of us could go for two nights to Amsterdam because we were speaking on different days and um, so where there's a will there is a way but I found that the help being an academic couple because you kind of yin yang and when I had a second child so when I had my daughter Amina he really run the lab for me right so I was on a maternity leave yet all the experiments were still happening so he was making sure that everybody knew what they were doing there was not a problem that I was available when when I was needed the rest of the time he could deal with it so when I came to back to work after my whatever it was, 16 weeks maternity leave, he actually planned an experiment for me. I was doing a glucose tolerance test to ease me back into the lab. So it, it, for me, it, it's helpful <laughs> and it has been helpful. <laughs> Until now, really? I can see the same actually, because it's, uh, yeah, I also, my, my husband is in the same field, uh, he's a, a, already a researcher uh, in uh, in the United States, so uh, this is also the reason for which I choose to go to US uh, to move again to US. But uh, um, and uh, I think that is really supportive, and uh, for me, it's really important. All this time, uh, uh, also is taking care of all these uh, documents to uh, for uh, traveling, and uh, also, uh, yeah, is um, my first sponsor actually. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes so, and so for for me uh, is the same actually I, I feel lucky for now but but we will see it's really short experience to, <laughs> it's a really short to my experience great thanks thanks uh, everyone uh, we have some questions also for the bias that you experience in workplace and it was actually also one of my questions like when when um when a woman becomes a mother it it somehow it feels like it enhances the multitasking abilities and also the efficiency what's your perception on this do you really feel that you you were able to multitask at a higher level and be more efficient after becoming mother 
or uh, or how, and the second question is how did you overcome the bias that were from your colleagues from your supervisor or from from the bosses because usually from the men view point view side it's always the case that when uh, a girl becomes a mother it's like it's lacking the abilities to work hard and to show success so what's what's your opinion on these two points you can start each other each uh, each uh, each uh, each one, whichever you want, sorry. Well, I think I've already touched upon it, Besa, in regards to not being asked to be on certain grants, etc. But I don't think I've found too much. It probably depends when you have your children as well. I think that's probably some something you're talking about and other, others can, can address that. Uh, but I, I always felt that being a mother did make me multitask a lot better or just be more efficient. Just thinking of my postdoc days, you know, I could spend all the hours in a day at work, but then a lot of it would be spent having a coffee, just having a chat, right? When I became a mother, that was cut out because it was what is necessary, <laughs> what's required. Right? You get your job done, exactly. But then you can do so much more. I always thought, I wish I was always this efficient, right? It's just like chop, 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 job done, right? And I think it also, with time, you start realizing that not everything needs to be 100% perfect. Sometimes it is... 80%, 75% is good enough, right? And I think you have to accept that not everything will always be as you will have expected from your yourself before. Uh, and I think that's probably the best way to, to deal with things. Um, I, I'll leave it to, to other panelists to discuss this. But I think, you know, I, I do really strongly believe that we become a lot better and a lot better organized when we have these these other things that we need to think about. Yeah, the, the I actually agree with this. I actually agree with this. I also noticed, uh, yeah, that that my time at the lab was really a time to work and to be very efficient. And then I went home the children in bed and then I opened up my computer again for data analysis for reading for put, putting everything together so this was this was more or less my working day I was working a lot late in late in the evenings uh, uh, at that time so I think it somewhat forced me to be more efficient at, at specific time points the bias is a difficult one I think also I'm not, yeah, I cannot judge from a man point of view about the bias, but what I can say is that I also made some conscious decisions to not step into things that distract me from science. For instance, I try to avoid politics as much as possible because it's, these are things that take time, that take time in the evenings, that do, that require much more networking. Um, and so I try to refrain from this as, as much as possible. There is a reason why I don't write that many reviews. This is because this is simply something I don't have the time for and I don't take the time to do so because I really want to focus on the really essentials that uh, like teaching research, which are associated to my job. Obviously not doing the politics sometimes results in you not being aware of uh, certain opportunities, not taking up certain opportunities. So it's also a bias that perhaps I actively chose to end up with. I'm, I'm not sure whether I explain it very well, but yeah, I, I think I, I also chose to not, yeah, yeah, to, to not take part of, of, of some things and, and that this might result in yeah having maybe less opportunities in in some areas or not. I don't know. I don't know. But I cannot say that I really experienced an active conscious bias against women for for certain mm -hmm. faculty uh, positions. Obviously, yeah, th the thing is that the selection criteria for a professorships are, are very hard, right? Uh, it's the number of publications, often mobility, 
often very hard, stringent selection criteria that are maybe a bit more favoring selection of males for specific uh, a professorship positions, where I, where I always also say that being a professor is completely different than being a researcher. The leadership potential is completely different and, and might, might favor some more female uh, characteristics or characteristics where, which are typically associated with, 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 with women. Yeah, so it's 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 difficult and it's not easy to change that system. I'm afraid. I'm yeah. I'm afraid. So yeah. It's... But but are the women, especially the mother uh, scientists, seen differently and um, selected differently in terms of positions like climbing the ladder, the bottleneck, the the positions of professorship and everything? Are, are they seen differently? I don't have this. Um this impression but it's just an impression i don't know I have, I have to say something like i've actually made a conscious effort to step into leadership i mean you know like the, the reason i do the dean of research job and i do lots of jobs on different funding committees all of these are in your spare time the funding committees this is all your spare time which i guess you could spend in research, but I think it's really important that we are in places where decisions are made and that our voices are heard because change cannot happen unless we are in leadership. So, um, you know, I've, I've actually gone the other way of making sure that actually if there is an opportunity, which is a leadership opportunity, yes, it may not benefit my research, but actually it's really important to be a role model for other women of what can be achieved and what is achievable. So I have to say I have actually I actively pursued those in order to make sure that I'm not the one complaining how things are not changing, because if we are not there at the table making decisions, things will never change. So, anyway. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, just to uh, a bit add on, uh, I felt my, my brain expanded when I had children. Uh, because I never thought I will be I will have been able to do so many things at the same time. And it happens uh, as well. When I have my first child, I thought I will never be able to have to do it in when I have two children. Then you manage. I don't know how you manage. You do it. And then when you have a third one, you also manage. So it's like magic. Is is so it definitely makes you more efficient. I was never for children very organized. I mean, yes, a, a bit of organization, but now I have to be well, I have super, super calendars. <laughs> I have colors, calendars, Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> who takes care of who? Definitely, uh, th that has to be improved. And in terms of a bias, um, I agree. I never felt uh, a bias directly to me, but it's true that there is 24 hours a day and it's so many things that you have to do that maybe you don't do so many as maybe a man can do. Um, and at the end of the day, the number of publications, the number of grants, the number of things, um, in a way, I mean, it takes you uh, a bit backward. Or um, I, I do think is still an advantage uh, for. It's, it's, it's maybe it's maybe as Catherine was saying, it's maybe a, my own decision that I I'm not stepping in in so many things because I I don't I have I haven't the time. So maybe it's more us than than men who who do, don't make you pursue. I don't know something like that. Okay, cool, amazing. Would you like to add something, Paula? Or uh, yeah, on... I, I have just to learn from today from these uh, <laughs> professors actually because I tell uh, yeah as I was saying before my experience of uh, being a mother and scientist is uh, really short so it's uh, like uh, um, uh, yeah I cannot say how uh, I will tell you uh, in uh, in May okay mm -hmm. when I start <laughs> 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 and I will say. <laughs> Yeah, cool. And um, also, uh, the latest hit that was um, that revealed a lot of the stark pressure on women was the pandemic, the COVID-19. And uh, we've faced a lot 
especially the working mothers that had to work from home while having the children around and trying to, to support them and to inspire them to keep going. I would like to know your opinion. And uh, do you think that it was really this pandemic that revealed the big pressure that women face holding, trying to hold or actually holding the work duties and the motherhood at the same time? I think it's, it's our own um, feelings. Um, me as a mother, I take that the kids need to to have the homework they need to have they need to have a shower they need to you know my husband is a really nice husband and he takes care of a lot of the children but maybe maybe he doesn't think is such important for me it's really important you know I don't know how to say so at the end of the day I I do it myself yeah I think the pandemic has revealed those inequalities because the 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 homeschooling duties have mostly been taken on by by women it's just the nature of maybe our the caring mm -hmm. the caring personalities we have I mean one thing that I know um, from my own experience when the pandemic came I was constantly constantly in teams meetings and I've, I, I think a lot of people were in the same thing they're almost trying to justify your job you know you're you're busy so you know this is what you're doing I, I felt so terrible and one night my husband and I were sitting in the evening the kids were in bed and we were going to Google Classroom to see what our daughter had been doing so she's 10 and she did something not quite right obviously during the school day and the teacher said Amina you didn't do this right and she said I'm sorry but I couldn't I couldn't ask for help from my parents because they were both busy. And she did come into the room, to the dining room where we were set up. And I remember going like, I'm busy. And my husband said he was busy because he was teaching online. So we worked out, actually, we cannot do that. So at this point, you know, we then had to make up a rule where, you know, somebody needs help, you come in, raise your hand. And if you're both busy, we'll just say every 10 minutes, right? But it, we felt terrible, both of us. Um, so I, I can't see that personally it was the case because both of us took on that responsibility that we need to share this load. And this is where I think it probably is easier having the partner who is also an academic because it may not necessarily be the case if, if, if it's not a person in a job that may be seen as more flexible because if you're in Aberdeen and you're in an oil industry, you know, you maybe can't step away from that. But what has come through, through you know, reading through nature, through our own early career researches, it has come through really clear that women have put in many less grants. Women have, have put in many less papers as first or last authors. And that it really has been that a lot of the responsibility did fall on women for the um, homeschooling child, and yeah, yeah. taking care of everything. Yeah, yeah, true, true. And how was the experience with you, Katrin? Having it was very tough. Home? <laughs> it was very tough. I think it... Um, yeah combining yeah the 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 care for the kids at home combining it with uh with continuing your work and trying to manage your lab and uh, the um, the the teaching uh, yeah this this was super tough so yeah i think the data are there right as as was mentioned already much less ERCs submitted by women less papers submitted by women so i think uh, i think i don't have to add much but it was quite tough i have to say <laughs> okay we're nearing the end and i'm um there's one question i'm very curious about have you ever been told that you have achieved a lot for a woman and how did you react on that never been told I've achieved a lot for a woman but for my age uh, something I constantly face is ageism by in the wrong sense you know people always think about ageism as something against people who are more advanced in age I have been told many a times in my face and behind my back that I have achieved an awful lot for my age um, so I, I think we need to break those biases as well um, because many of us are mature before, you know, before we are ready to be mature. So, uh, but not as a woman, no. Not as a woman, okay. What about you others? No, me neither, no, no. Okay, cool, cool. No, I have to say, I have to say, admit though that 
I cannot recall the number of times I have been introduced as Professor Catherine de Bock, by the way, mother of four kids. <laughs> as if this is... That is amazing. As if I'm, I'm like, an, yeah. That is a cherry on top. Yeah, <laughs> it's <a standard> line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so, I think so we'll have uh, a little bit of minutes left at the end before I proceed with some of the questions from the participants. Um, I would like to, to, to say something about, you know, we've all faced a time when cells had to be split, the medium had to be changed, or the mice had to be fed during the weekend or holiday, and no babysitter around. So in this case, what we do, we just bring our child with us in the lab. And I bet you have uh, some funny, amazing stories with you, like weighing the mice or splitting the cells from uh, the, the children of Katrin, something like this, you would like to share with us? Yeah, so I, I did this actually. I, um, I used to bring my kids to the lab in the weekends when, when I had to come and uh, split the cells. And at that time, so I'm talking about 20, uh, period 27, 2013. So this was before the animal ethics procedures became much more stringent. Uh, so they are much more stringent nowadays than they were before. So what I used to do is I... I put my my kids in the animal facility and I gave them um, a cage with mice and uh, put them some clothes on from the animal facility so they 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 were allowed to play with the mice while I was splitting splitting the cells and one day old, I arrived how old back, were they? How they old were they? I think around yeah six seven uh, back then at least uh, the the oldest two and at one one day I just arrived in the animal facility and my daughter she was crying like hell and one one of the mice bit her in 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 Aww. the finger and since then since she then didn't want to weigh them anymore <laughs> she <laughs> refused to, to sit in the animal facility so she can split cells as well now Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> That's nice. That's funny. Yeah. In my case, I couldn't bring my children, but many times when my children were really young and they became ill at nursery, they called me and I had to throw the cells to the bean and go run, run to pick my, my child because he had some temperature. And, and then the next day it starts again. I, ha I had a very nice colleague of mine who, who helped me a lot as well when I had these problems. But, Every time my kid had some temperature or anything, I had to run and, and my experiment was just gone. <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess for Paola, this question does not really apply. Maybe later yeah. on we can just go for it. Right now, maybe uh, we just go on to the questions. I don't know if you would like to answer now or just write the text. But um, how will, I, will go, go, I will go through them. And the first one is from Rebecca. And she's uh, saying that, um, you know, the career path in research is not very secure, so that you have to rely on winning funding quite regularly. And job security is not always guaranteed. And was this uh, a concern or consideration for any of the panel members when deciding to plan or having a family? I think we have already touched this, this topic. But if you would like to add something, please. Well, I think career, it's always been the case. It's never been not the case. So I, absolutely. But I, hopefully the discussions that have happened have revealed that, you know, I've always, when I mentor people, I always say you want to make yourself indispensable, you know. So you want to do your research, but you want to make sure you do your teaching. You want to make sure you're in some committees. So, you know, but you're always kind of, hedging your bets that you're going to keep the job or you're going to get into the next job sort of thing but it's always been insecure it's just the nature of the job um and navigating it i think we just we just learn how to navigate it from other people i guess okay anyone would like to comment on this or i pass by to the next question for which um I think the question from Katie Zeka, we've already touched this because it's the to balance um, like the, the help from the partner and the other one from Rebecca, it's uh, the bias, which we discussed uh, about and uh, I pass by to the next one. We have one from Odeta and uh, there is a phrase, there is a special place in heaven for, for women who support other women. What was your experience or opinion for this aspect? Did you get enough support from your women or men colleagues? 
That's so it's interesting. It's interesting that Dita said that because uh, I've heard the uh, the phrase in the opposite direction. There's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. <laughs> <laughs> she just made the positive way. <laughs> That's a really nice way of putting it. <laughs> I have to say though that. Um, um, we have a special group, like a WhatsApp group with the female professors in the department. We we go on a weekend, but not on a weekend, because I think this is important, right? That we can, that you do these things not in the weekend, but uh, so we, we, we go for a, a female professor weekend uh, yearly to discuss and to brainstorm mostly about science. Um, I feel quite committed to supporting uh, women in science and I have the impression that many female professors do so try to support uh, their postdocs etc or, or PhD students and each other uh, as much as possible so this this old story about yeah it's women against women I don't feel this I have to say on the contrary where we are we are quite connected uh, uh, within within ETH um so and also I I think that quite some male professors are heavily devoted towards supporting the needs of female professors at, at university. So I have experienced actually a lot of support from, from many people. That's good. Yeah, I, I would not say maybe it's men or women. I will say that if you've not experienced this situation, if you're not a mother or father yourself, sometimes it's really difficult, even if you're young or older, maybe it's difficult to imagine what, what we have to juggle. I think maybe not in a bad intention, but some, often I think if you have to leave early or you have to escape because your child has some temperature, maybe sometimes they don't understand or it's difficult for them to understand. Yeah. I agree with that. I've been told that many a times that actually certain PIs who were notorious after having had their own children became a lot more understanding. So I think that's a really important point. The empathy to increases, right? Um, yes. the empathy increases. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then uh, Perika is uh, kind of complaining that uh, when she sacrifices family time for research, she feels terribly guilty. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on helping her? Either oh. not to sacrifice her time for research or either not to feel guilty. I think that, I mean, we touched upon this before. This I was the devil, right? Yeah. <laughs> we all suffer from the very same issue. And I wish there was a way to get around it. But uh, yeah, I, 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 for me, it, yeah, it never went away. The only thing is I can comfort myself nowadays more with the knowledge that my children actually are very interested in what what I do they became very interested in science they they know what is the difference between a correlation and causality so we discuss about uh, about science so they have they have this interest and I think they they have, they mean well see the the advantages of these these things uh, as as well this said I mean in in the past I have sacrificed a lot for to combine my career with 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 motherhood. I mean, I I quit doing competitive sports for some time. I as I mentioned, I don't have a television. So yeah, so you still don't I think all of us have to have to make make sacrifices, but I feel okay now with those. I mean my yeah, I haven't, I haven't, yeah, my mind is is ease now with 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 the choices I've made and uh so there with... is no need to have this guilt uh, because the kids, they don't suffer from it. It's I think it's you that suffers or we that suffer the most, but the kids, they don't suffer from it. I agree because, completely. Yeah. And it's, it is our own guilt. And like all that touched upon it, you pass by the school and you'll see all these people all made up looking beautiful, <laughs> standing around and you, you're going to work. I felt guilty for for 
for many years when the kids are smaller, but I would agree with you, Catherine, now the kids are bigger and we have these conversations in the evenings at dinner table. The conversations are so interesting and they're better for it. And they're really proud, I think, of their mothers who are working and successful. So overall, I think if you stick to it, you're kind of right through the storm and it, it is for the good, or at least we've convinced ourselves that it's for yeah. the good. <laughs> no, I agree. And my partner always talks told me when I was a bit depressed or like that he always told me look it's the quality of the time not the quantity of the time so I kept repeating myself that it's the quality (laughs) (laughs) and uh, (laughs) and, but I I think it's true and and now that my oldest son is older I ask him sometimes are you happy do you think you have a good mother (laughs) yes the best mother (laughs) in the world yeah he says yes (laughs) so I think I think it's important that they see as well no yeah that we are working that we other kind of qualities that maybe if we weren't a uh, researcher, we will not have. And they, they are very understanding, I have to say. I mean, I sometimes, sometimes when I'm quiet at the dinner table in the evenings, my children, they say to each other, yeah, she's writing papers in her head again. Don't, don't worry about this. It's like she's, she's, she's somewhere else. And then, or mostly it's most often. It's cool. Amazing. Okay. And uh, I have one last uh, question or comment from Sadia and it's, uh, it's something funny. So my question may be funny that in day-to-day routine, how, uh, I miss it, how many, how you make visible your femininity and motherhood and your scientific spirit together in symbols like pictures in the office as motherhood and the sci- uh, science magnet on the fridge at home. I'm not sure if, if, uh, if, if we're getting the... I, I have a small microscope at home which yeah i i brought from yeah from the lab which was standing here for 50 years something like it's a very old one so we and it's still functional it's still functional it has a working uh working light so it's it's still functional yet for i mean i used to sometimes bring my kids to the lab or, or they come to pick me up so everybody knew i was a mother uh but i yeah i didn't have pictures from my kids in the office i have to say i have one now but i don't i didn't have this as a as a phd or postdoc uh, this this i didn't have yeah i you know, don't know how i integrated this okay that's the question you you got it right so maybe uh, we pass on if uh, mirela or olga or I'm just oh, looking no, at like my office. I've still got <laughs> pictures from the nursery and they've grown up almost. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I like, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding the question, but I think hopefully, hopefully I have combined it. I quite like the fluidity between the workplace and the home place. Um, and one thing I have discouraged is for my children to become scientists. I told them, do whatever you want, don't be a scientist. <laughs> so I'm not like you, Catherine, I have to say. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure that um, I, I am really calling the question but very often so like when my sister's children come over as well so if it's the holidays etc we do experiments together in the house because you know Tetka or auntie is the scientist so we actually do do a whole lot of activities and I like my kids still love doing it and her kids or the younger one likes doing it so we do try and interchange this and it's quite nice and I've gone into my kids schools as well and and done kind of maths week where you talk why maths is relevant in your research but I would then take bottles of little bottles of insulin and then to show them how you know, how you do calculations and why it's important to inject the right amount of insulin if you want to survive sort of thing. So, and I think everybody likes it. So I think being a scientist is actually probably the best job one can have, but obviously we're all biased. (laughs) Cool, cool, amazing. Okay, so um, do we have another question or not? No, we're just having some thank you for sharing these experiences and everything. If someone else does not have a question or any comments, I don't know if the chairman has any question or something, or Nela, I don't, I'm not sure. Thank you very much for your experiences, ladies. Uh, 
I, I'm I'm not a mother, <laughs> but uh, it has been a quite interesting discussion. Uh, maybe for future self, it will be quite helpful. Um, save the recording, please. <laughs> yes, yes, I've saved the recording and we'll post it. So uh, everybody like me in the future, when they see it, they will have something to 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 look at and to learn from. Um, I, I don't think we have uh, any more questions. Um, I think what you said is really interesting because I do have colleagues who have said that they are not mothers and nor do they want to be mothers. And I think that is, again, it's absolutely fine. We all make decisions. And I think, you know, as long as we can try and find out ways how we find those paths through different challenges that are in front of us, that's what matters, right? So um, just wanted to kind of say that as well. Okay, if there is a will, there is a way, no? <laughs> Always. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, I would like you say I would like to thank you all for all the experiences that you've shared. We're running um, on time or out of time a little bit. I'm not sure your agenda is very busy, so I won't take more of your time. I would like to thank you so much for everything you shared with us, and uh, it was very much my pleasure. Well, thank you for the invitation today. I think it's been absolutely amazing meeting all these other wonderful ladies. And I think it's just, you know, it's a shame we do these things only on the 8th of March. I think these sorts of panels are really relevant all the time. So I really enjoyed meeting you all. So thank you. Yeah. And probably it would have been even better if it would be live, but oh, yeah, yeah. with the agenda is way too busy for, especially for professors to meet in live. And this so, makes it more accessible to everybody else. So there is a good thing that's come out of the pandemic and that lots of people can get access to lots of other people that otherwise wouldn't have been able to. So yeah, I think it's so. opened up opportunities. Yeah, also to combine family time. Yeah, <laughs> that's well, <you> know. <laughs> difficult. Some, some things are good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have a nice week ahead and uh, happy International Women's Day again. And hope like to that. see you soon or meet you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Take Have care. Nice Thank you so much. Bye. Yes. Bye. Congratulations Bye. to all of you. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Congratulations. Bye. 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 Bye.